All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, I pray that you help us uh, today as we look at the perfection of your word, um, the promises of your word, the power of your word. Um, I pray that you help me not get in the way of your word uh, this morning. Um, I pray that it would draw us in to love you more. I pray that by the Spirit that you would allow us to apply these promises to our lives and follow the careful instructions that you've given us. I pray the end result will be trophies of grace uh, so that Christ will be glorified in eternity and that Christ will be glorified on earth through our lives. Would you grant uh, this because of what he has done in our behalf? For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So this is kind of an unusual talk uh, for me. Um, I was planning on doing another talk, uh, and I started putting together something this morning. I wanted to do a few slides on the promises of God to believers, and... I ran out of time, and I wished I had hours and hours uh, to work on this, uh, but it's warmed my heart, and I pray that God will use it as means of grace in all of our lives. Um, for all the slideshows, uh, you should have access to all of them. Um, there's a, a link that says um, uh, link to all the resources for this class. That should be my Dropbox account. And uh, so don't think you have to write all these down if you find them uh, encouraging. But God's promises to believers, and uh, don't forget to uh, take the attendance quiz 37. Thank you for being so diligent uh, to do that. That's a big help. And as always, I invite you to turn your phone off, uh, disconnect, uh, just enjoy uh, God's uh, word just uh, washing over you uh, through this talk. We're only going to do two things uh, today. Uh, God's promises to you as a believer, and then what do we do with those promises? So let's uh, dive in. What has God promised to believers uh, God has promised uh, the ultimate in intimacy. Um, the Bible says that when God created human sexuality, he created it to point beyond itself to a greater spiritual truth. Um, m most people find the intimacy within uh, marriage uh, one of the greatest delights uh, uh, possible on earth, and God is saying that's the cartoon version of something in heaven. Um, there isn't uh, physical sexuality in heaven, but whatever it is that uh, uh, people experience on earth, that's the cartoon version, uh, the two-dimensional version of something that's real in heaven. And let's look at that. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up in its, uh, its place with flesh, and the rib uh, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he house-built into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now remember, uh, when this happened, we're talking about two people who are absolutely naked, and they're living in what's called the Garden of Pleasure, and that word Eden um, may actually refer to sexual pleasure. It's used that way at least uh, one time when uh, Sarah says, well, a woman 90 years old have this Edana, have this uh, pleasure of uh, intimacy and childbirth. Um, God is the one who orchestrated that. God orchestrated the delight of it. Uh, God um, 
orchestrated everything about it. God did it. And that's the image that God uh, has when he describes what's going to happen with Christ in the church. Uh, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm telling you that that refers to Christ in the church. Uh, It's so wonderful to see uh, two people who've waited uh, to come together in marriage and just the absolute delight of that. And God is saying, take that image and multiply it a thousand times and you're still nowhere close to what uh, I've planned for Christ and the church. So there's an intimacy there that's promised uh, for believers. And um, I think often people on earth uh, are looking uh, for intimacy and ultimate intimacy, and they're trying to find it in all kinds of different ways. But God created it where the ultimate intimacy is going to be Christ in the church in heaven. And you can see that's the picture. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come. Uh, Think of the delight of two people as they're planning their wedding, as as they're counting down the days, as they just uh, can't wait to be together. That's the image of the eschaton. That's the promise that God uh, is making. Uh, 21.2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 21.9, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Bible starts with a cosmic wedding. It ends with a cosmic wedding. And you think of the kind of language that's applied to two people coming together in that kind of intimacy. Here's one verse, a song of Solomon. I came to my garden, uh, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. Uh, I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine uh, with my milk. Eat, uh, friends, drink, be drunk with love. Uh, And that's talking about sexual love. Um, uh, The the image of of two lovers, uh, married lovers, and just the delight of that, that's the picture. And God says, I created that to point beyond itself to a greater spiritual truth. Uh, God, uh, in in another analogy, puts it this way. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I wish I had time to put the Greek uh, up for this slide because the word translated there, uh, rooms, is actually, in Greek, the word alone places. In my father's house, so the picture is this grand mansion, uh, just a mansion beyond belief. And in my father's house, there are many alone places. Uh, Do you have a place like that, you know, at your house? It's kind of your place. Uh, At my house, uh, I've got a, you know, we had five kids and uh, three of them are in the world now so uh, our house is starting to empty out some and uh, every time a kid moves out uh, either my wife or I will take over their room for something and so uh, my youngest son moved out and I took over his room uh, and it became my study and nobody's ever going to get it back they're going to pry it out of my cold dead hand you know because I love that space and uh, my wife did the same thing when uh, my oldest son uh, took over his room, and we've got two more, and who knows what's going to happen when they move out. Maybe we'll knock one of those walls out and make bigger offices or something. I don't know. Uh, but it's a place. It's a place that's like a perfect place. And uh, Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are lots of places like that. Uh, there are places where... Uh, 
you, God is saying, uh, where you and I uh, will be alone together. Um, I'm preparing that for you. So not only is there this intimacy, there's also community. Uh, God is promising community to believers. Uh, Romans 12, 4 and 5, For as in one body we all have many members, and the members do not have the same function, uh, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually are members of one another. And you think about how your own body works. I mean, your hand works, your feet work, your ears work, your eyes work, everything works together. All of it makes up you. And God is saying, I'm going to so unify uh, the believers in heaven that they're going to be different. They're going to be hands, feet, ears, eyes, but it's one body. Uh, it's, it's going to be unified. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, of meeting someone who's radically different from you and then at the same time that you have this incredible connection. Um, uh, you'll meet people like that in your life where it's just, uh, they're, you know, some people say a friend is a second self. It's really easy to be friends with people like that. They, you know, have all the same opinions and experiences. But every now and then you'll meet someone who's radically different, and yet there's a unity, and, and you're just drawn to those people. Well, imagine being part of a community where everybody was like that, uh, that there's a, a difference, but there was this fundamental unity like the unity of a body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Um, Romans uh, 8, uh, 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Uh, so this is another uh, picture, uh, someone uh, being taken into a family, not born into the family, but taken into that family uh, by being adopted. You know, we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Uh, the Ezekiel 36, uh, my favorite Old Testament uh, passage, says, I will take you from the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries, and I'll bring you into your own land. And I, I love that in English, but that English doesn't even begin to do justice of everything that verse is saying in Hebrew because when it uses the word, I will gather you. Uh, remember how we've talked in here before about how there are seven different ways in Hebrew you can say something, and it's like the standard way, the intense way, the causative, the reflexive. Well, the intensive way of saying something in Hebrew, uh, you put it in what's called the PL. And uh, the, the analogy that we're taught is if you take the word kill and it's in the call stem, it means kill. But if you put that in the PL, it, it takes the word kill and it like doubles it. Uh, so the, in the PL, the word kill means slaughter or slaughter the daylights out of or slaughter till there's no one uh, left, when this says, I will gather you from all the countries, it doesn't say, I will gather you in the call. It says, I will PL gather you. I'll gather the daylights out of you. I'll gather you till you can't see straight. I'll massively get, I don't even know how you could translate that in English, but that's the promise. The people who belong to that ultimate community are going to God is going to PL gather them into one. So not only is there intimacy and community, but there's unbelievable wealth that's promised to that uh, community. Uh, and let's look at how that promise works out. Genesis 3, 
24, he drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword and turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So if you think of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Pleasure, the Garden of Luxury, uh, the Garden of Delight, however you want to translate that, uh, the man and his wife are being driven out of that. But you think about that garden and the ultimate potential, it's like uh, when you were in possession of that garden, you had been given a great estate uh, by the king. And uh, the king is telling you, I want you to take that estate and I want you to, to be godlike in developing into something great. And you think of the massive wealth of that. If, if you knew a little bit about building and you had uh, millions and millions and millions of acres of uh, timber and stone and, and uh, uh, hydroelectric power, you think about what you could do in that, um, uh, with all that if you had infinite resources. That's what you possessed in Eden. But when we sinned, we were driven out and we were uh, excluded uh, because of these cherubs. Well, when uh, we're redeemed, God is giving us that back. And I put this slide on there because this is uh, when it describes the Garden of Eden in the Septuagint, it translates it as the paradox of luxury. What did we have? We had an estate that was called the paradise of luxury, and we're getting that back because the promise is I'll take you from the nations, I'll gather the daylights out of you, and I will bring you into your own Adama. Can you hear the echo of the Eden language there? That God is saying, uh, you were driven out. You lost this grand estate. Uh, you had infinite ability to develop it into uh, the, the paradise of luxury. And God's saying, I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give you that title back to your Adama. And uh, just uh, as we look at whole Bible biblical theology, when God made the temple, he was making the temple to look like a mini version of the Garden of Eden. And he says, you'll make two cherubs of gold, of hammered work you'll make, and put them on the end of the mercy seat. And so inside that cubic holy of holies, uh, their cherubs, uh, representatives of cherubs, and the idea is somehow this is uh, the Eden of God. This is the garden of luxury, the paradise of luxury, because cherubs are there. And we see that the cherubs are on the veil, uh, uh, excluding everyone uh, except the high priest from the holy place. And if we just point out that uh, in Greek, the word for veil is this peculiar word, katapetosma. Uh, you will make a katapetosma, uh, and it's going to separate. Well, notice when Jesus died on the cross, it says the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Now, why that's important is uh, what we've seen in this slide is on that veil, there were cherubs cherubs excluding us from the garden of pleasure, from the delights of luxury. But when Jesus died, that curtain was torn in two. And look at the Greek word that's used there. It's that same peculiar word, katapetosma. And you can see it here. You will make a katapetosma. And now that katapetosma is torn in two because Jesus' death has opened the gates of paradise uh, for us. Therefore, brothers, this is Hebrews 10, uh, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that new and living way that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and bodies washed with water. And notice there, same word, uh, through the veil, through the katapetosma. Uh, Jesus' death has opened that up. And what we see in Ezekiel 10 is the earthly picture of the cherubs, um, which is meant to mimic the garden of luxury. Ezekiel sees those same cherubs, only now they're in heaven. And the cherubim mounted up. These are the living creatures that I saw by the Kibar Canal. And when the cherubim went, uh, wheels went beside them. And the cherubs uh, lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, and the wheels did not turn uh, from beside them. No one knows what that means. Uh, but it sure sounds almost like science fiction to me. These four-faced creatures that never turn but can move in any direction, and wheels within wheels, and uh, eagles' faces, and man's faces, and... Uh, and it's like, oh my goodness, whatever it is on earth that's presented as these cherubs, there's a reality of that in heaven. And that is the title deed that God is giving to us because we are excluded from our inheritance and Jesus is bringing us back to that. The same four creatures we see in the heavenly Jerusalem uh, therefore, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Odd thing about that sea of glass in uh, Revelation 15 is described as being on fire. I don't know about your experience with water, but my experience with water is that it doesn't burn all that well. Uh, this is talking about water being on fire, and I'm told by some of my scientist friends that if you put water under enough pressure, you can actually make it uh, burn hypercritical uh, water. I don't know what it's talking about, but oh my goodness, something in heaven that's corresponding uh, to that sea of glass. And what's by that sea of glass perhaps functioning uh, is Ezekiel's 10 uh, veil uh, excluding from the heavenly holy of holies. It says this, on each side of the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, second ox, third man, fourth like an eagle. Do you realize that's picking up the description from Ezekiel 10? And so what Ezekiel excluded from the presence of God was looking through that crystal and seeing God. Now in Revelation 4, for every single person who's part of the re redeemed of God, they're there. They're in the Holy of Holies, the cosmic Holy of Holies with God. And God in the Old Testament kept saying, I will meet you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubs. And now in Revelation, God's people are, are in the midst of four cherubs, but those cherubs aren't killing us because Jesus has made us not sinners anymore. So we have intimacy. We have community. We have unbelievable wealth. And we're surrounded by humble, perfect people. This is God's promise. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit uh, the earth. The Greek of that says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land by lot. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land by lot. Strange word, kleronomeo. Uh, kleros is a lot, and nomeo is related to the word law. And you think about biblical theology. What did Joshua do when he was divvying out the land? He cast lots, and he gave... Uh, portions to different people at the direction of God. And Jesus is saying the people who will inherit uh, a portion in the new heavens and the new earth, every single one of those people will be meek. Have you ever been around pushy people like just 
they just want to talk all the time. They want to get their way. They never want to uh, defer. They never, they never seek the good of others. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, found uh, people like that, but those people are taxing to be around. Nobody in heaven is going to be like that. Because the people in heaven will be made meek by Jesus. They'll be gracious people. They'll be other-oriented people. Those are the people who will obtain the kingdom of God by lot. They're people who have this attitude toward that kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up and then in joy goes out and sells all that he has to buy that field. Uh, that's what people in heaven, every single person in heaven is going to be like that. They're just going to be so in love with the kingdom of God that it's, it's going to be the greatest good. And then, oh my goodness, uh, what a great promise this is. Hebrews 12, uh, 23. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirit, spirits of righteous people. And in Greek, uh, righteous people made perfect, but literally in Greek, to the spirits of righteous people, having been made perfect. Uh, every now and then on earth, uh, you get a glimpse of someone who is just living life to the full in one area of their uh, life. And, you, and you're just around people like that and you're drawn to it. And you say, wow, there's something, uh, there's something so right about how uh, this person is, is functioning here. And for all the people in heaven, they will be having been made perfect. And the implication is by God. Every single person in heaven, whatever it is that's wrong with all of us now, that's going to be completely fixed uh, in heaven. Um, I, I know that uh, by God's grace, there are some things in, in life that, that I, I do okay at. Uh, and uh, I, I know that God has, has helped me bring grace to people. But I know there's a lot in my life that isn't right. Um, I, I know one of the things that just frustrates the daylights out of me is I can be just way plain, too plain spoken about things. And sometimes if I'm talking with someone, uh, I don't even realize how hurtful my words uh, can be. I hate that about myself. Uh, and I'll say things and, and I'll think, wow, I wish I had been a little bit more gracious in the way I uh, said that. It's a brokenness uh, uh, about me. And, and I see people in my family who don't have that brokenness. And I'm just so drawn. Uh, my wife is so gracious. Uh, she, she is so uh, just uh, gracious. And, and I'm just, at times, I can just not be. But the promise of God is that in heaven, every single person, the spirits of just people having been made perfect, completely fixed. Whatever is wrong with any of us now, uh, then it's going to be having been made perfect by God. Uh, another promise for every single person who's a part of God's people is that there's no condemnation. Uh, yeah, I put that slide um, out of order, but he, uh, here's one. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises that through them, and this is not me saying this, this is God's word, you may become partakers 
the divine nature. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean we're going to become God, but it means something. We are going to become the partakers of the divine nature. Uh, is that Jesus perfected human nature? That just as perfected as Jesus, human nature uh, is that we're going to become like that. We're going to uh, have the character qualities of God, of wisdom, compassion, justice, uh, uh, all, all kinds of things. We're going to be like him, partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in uh, the world because of sinful desire. I kind of like what Athanasius says about this. He says, the son of God became a son of man so that you and I, uh, though being sons of men, may become the sons of God. And he didn't mean that in terms of deification, but he's saying like uh, the character qualities of the son. And for every single one of the people who share those promises, it says there is therefore now no condemnation. Look, look at that promise. There is therefore now, right now. Paul's just said, oh, wretched man that I am. You're uh, probably uh, memorizing that uh, verse and he, saying, I don't do the things I want to do. I uh, do, do the things I don't want to do. Oh, wretched man. And his conclusion is, there's therefore now condem no condemnation. Why? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. You're on an inextricable path to complete perfection in heaven. And God's saying, I'm not condemning you now because Jesus has signed his name. You have his perfection and he's going to make you perfect in heaven. I, I have no condemning. Now, does that mean that God doesn't look at our lives and see things that trouble him? Absolutely. Uh, the same way a parent might look at a child who is immature and selfish. Uh, it's disagreeable to the parent, but there's no condemnation because the parent knows that that child's not going to be like that uh, forever. You and I have the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that imputed righteousness inevitably is going to turn us into actually righteous people. And God says, I don't have any problem uh, with that. There is no condemnation if you're in Christ. Jesus says it this way, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Uh, if you're part of God's uh, people, uh, does God condemn you today? And Jesus says, no. If you're believing in him, you are not condemned. And if you don't believe, you're already condemned. Um, I don't understand quite how that works, but Jesus is talking about an entity that lives outside of uh, time. Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, right now we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. 8.11, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, this is part of our memory verse, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Uh, 8.33, not part of our memory verse, but still a promise. Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It's God who declares righteous. Who... Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So not only is there intimacy, community, unbelievable wealth, humble, perfect people, uh, no condemnation, uh, there's also new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
I wish I had time to put in this slide uh, Genesis 1. Um, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, earth was without form and void, darkness on the face of the deep. Spirit of God was intensely hovering, PL hovering over the water. And God said, let there be light. Boom. And there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated light from darkness. The New Testament understands that as an actual factual historic event, but they also understand it as an event that is pointing beyond itself to a greater spiritual truth. The same God who said, let there be light, is the God who says, if you're in Christ, you are righteous. Your entire life on earth is the cosmic microsecond between God saying, you are righteous, and boom, you are righteous. And God sees the righteousness is good, and God separates the righteousness from the unrighteousness. Uh, God speaks things into existence. To, to live with God in heaven, you've got to have a pure heart. Well, how do you get a pure heart? Well, David, in the midst of adultery and murder, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And if you look at the Hebrew of that, it's the same word, bara, bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and David says, uh, bara in me, O Elohim, a pure heart. Don't fix a broken heart. Create a heart in me. Create a pure heart. I can't create it uh, on my own. Uh, Galatians says uh, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but what does count for something is kinekatesis, is brand new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, even on the Israel of God. Uh, Paul says we are buried with him in baptism unto death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. There's a connection between Christ and the believer. Uh, and uh, even though we were not yet born, when Jesus died on the cross, God was connecting our fallen flesh with Jesus. And when Jesus allowed himself to be murdered, that murder of Jesus m murdered rightly our fallen nature. We are con connected with him. And when he died, we died. And when we, he was put in the tomb, we were put in the tomb. And when he was raised, we were raised. And when he was exalted to heaven, we were exalted. And uh, right now in heaven, Jesus is unified with your flesh to the extent that right now in heaven, if you're a believer, then your perfected flesh is existing with Jesus on the throne right now. And Paul says, seek the things of above where your life is hidden with Christ in God. The struggle with the sin that you have here isn't going to be your struggle forever. It may be 10 years, 20, 40, 60, but the day will come when uh, that struggle is over and Jesus will give you the totality of that new uh, nature and you will live in that new nature in heaven uh, with Jesus uh, forever. Isaiah promised this truth. Behold, I create the new heavens and new earth, and the former things will not even be remembered or not even come to mind. God, um, God is creating a bride who's going to so love her husband that she's just untemptable by evil. And on earth, uh, Ezekiel 36 will say, we'll think about the stuff we used to do and we'll loathe ourselves and we'll... Uh, but when this happens in heaven, it's like that's not even going to come to mind anymore. Be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and no more shall be heard the sound of weeping or the sound of distress. God is going to wipe away every tear. So not only is there intimacy, community, unbelievable wealth, humble, perfect people, no condemnation, 
new creation, but God says that you will be like Jesus. Here are the promises. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is because it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. This is called the beatific vision. Uh, either when Jesus comes back or in death when we see Jesus, we will see him like he is. And for believers, that uh, sight is called the beatific vision, and it will completely fix everything that's wrong uh, with us. Same idea for those he foreknew, he also predestined. How did he predestine them? To be conformed to the image of his son. In order that God, uh, in order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom God predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right now in heaven with Jesus, your perfected human nature is glorified by God. God walks around his mansion and points out your life and says, can you believe that? Can you believe how perfect this is? Let me show you this. This is, and it's you that he's showing because you're perfect in Jesus. And notice he doesn't say, Paul doesn't say he will glorify. He says he has glorified it. He's already done it. Now in heaven, uh, same thing, beatific vision, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's why when people go to heaven in vision and they'll see somebody, they always fall down and start worshiping the person because they think it, that person's God. And the person always has to say, oh, I'm not God. <laughs> Sorry, you mistook me there, but I, I'm not God. <laughs> That's what is, is happening for all the people who will see uh, uh, the Lord in heaven. Not only will you uh, be like Christ, but you will love God's law and you will obey it. Um, a lot of people... Uh, God, our, our God, the God of the Bible, loves antinomies. Uh, Jesus is fully God and fully man. There's one way to explain that where you keep both those truths. Uh, uh, you're saved uh, by uh, God's electing grace, but that you still have to do things. There's one way to, to explain that. Uh, God is three, God is one. There's one way to bring those two antinomies together. And there's an antinomy of you're saved by sovereign grace, but that salvation means that you actually keep the law. And people often will come to an antinomy and try to do justice to one side and neglect the other. And so often people will uh, see grace and they'll reject this idea of ever following God's law. Well, they're that's a mistake. And people will say, well, you follow God's law, but they reject God's grace. There's one way to understand that, and this is through uh, God's uh, new covenant work. You will love God's law and obey it. Here are the passages. And the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. What's the result of that circumcision? That you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and what will be the result that you may live? Uh, Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Uh, Jeremiah says, Circumcise yourselves, remove the foreskins of your flesh. Now, nobody can circumcise themselves. It's too painful. But God over and over in the Old Testament will say, Try. Try to fix yourself. Circumcise yourself. Fix yourself so that you'll do it. And 
you try and it's like, I can't pull that off. I can't do it. I can't circumcise myself. And then God says, okay, you're, you're ready for the promise. Because behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. Not like the covenant I made with their forefathers. Uh, Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. It was written on tablets of stone. I'm going to take away their stony heart. I'm going to put a real heart. I'm going to write my law on it. Same passage. uh, I'll write it on their uh, same idea, Ezekiel 36. And in the New Testament, therefore you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you will live in a celestial city. We don't have time to go through these, but remember when John measured that city, it's almost 1,400 miles. Uh, that's seven times where the uh, international or uh, it's the International Space Station is one seventh of what that is. That's when John saw it. Who knows what it is now? Uh, we're headed to a celestial city. Um, so four minutes, what do we do with all these promises? This is what we do with the promises. We repent and believe. We continually turn from self-rule to God's rule. Uh, salvation isn't something that you do, uh, once and then like, oh, I did that back then, uh, A life of faith is continually repenting and continually believing. This this is the work of God. Believe on the one whom he sent. John 3.3, everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. 2 Peter 2.1 that we read, partakers of the divine nature, this is what Peter says you should do with that promise. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with agape. For if these qualities are yours in increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. Paul says it this way, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always to obey, uh, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. And then he says this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. These promises, you have these promises, what should you do? Work out your uh, own salvation with fear and trembling. And then Paul embraces the other side of the antinomy. Why should you work hard? Because it's God who works in you, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. For all who receive him, believed on his name, he gave the right to become the tekna thau, the children of God. So uh, what what I would say about uh, this talk today and what I found just a great practice is get a list of verses like these and make it part of your quiet time every now and then. Pray through them to God. Pray through these promises and then take the instruction, what the scriptures say, and take those to God and say, God, Uh, You say, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I can't do these things on my own. But you've made these promises. Give me the ability to do these things, to believe, to walk, uh, to purify myself as you are pure. Uh, And in doing that, bring great 
honor and glory to your son. All right, well, we've run out of time, so I'll see you on Friday. And if I forget, um, there there is a notebook due on Saturday, but for Thanksgiving week, there's no notebook. So just come to class on Monday, but you don't have any, um, any uh, homework to do then. So I'll see you on Friday.